Hello, thanks for coming by. Welcome, Whistlekick, Martial Arts Radio. That's what this is. This is also episode 337, and this is the episode where we talk about Ip Man. I'm Jeremy Lesnick. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and I love traditional martial arts. So I made it my job. It's my life, my passion, and everything I do with Whistlekick, with this wonderful team is to expand traditional martial arts to give you whatever you need to make traditional martial arts a bigger, more important, more substantial part of your life. Check out the show notes with transcripts, photos, videos, and so much more at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Find links to everything we do on the web, including our products, other websites, just so much at whistlekick.com. You can find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. And you could email me if you wanted. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com. We're always looking for great suggestions for guests. Let's dig in. Let's talk about Ip Man. You might have heard of the movie series Ip Man. Starred Hong Kong actor slash American actor Donnie Yen. It's a martial arts movie depicting the life of Ip Man through the storyline, which is based in reality but it's not completely factual. It's been altered a bit for the sake of entertainment. Now, Ip Man, or Yip Man, was a Chinese martial arts master of Wing Chun Kung Fu. The most popular student he had was, of course, Bruce Lee. Ip Man was born on October 1st, 1893, in Foshan, Guangdong, in China, to a wealthy family. His father was Yip Oi Dor, and his mother was Wu Shui. It was the third child to the eldest, Yip Kai Guk, Yip Wan Mei, and he had a younger brother, Yip Wan Hum. All the children received a t- traditional Chinese education. It witnessed the turmoil in China at an early age. When he was just two years old, the Qing dynasty began to collapse. China unpredictably lost the first Sino-Japanese War, which caused great humiliation in China. Just two years later, the emperor was seized by Empress Dowager during a coup. These incidents led to the formation of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists, or, quote, boxers, who declared themselves a supporting force for the government. But their actions only worsened the situation. China was compelled to declare war on Europe, Japan, and Russia, and China lost shortly after. After the uprising, many of these boxers were executed, which, understandably, made the Kung Fu masters keep a low profile in the meantime. When he was seven, Ip saw foreign armies invade northern China. Ip saw an opportunity to study Wing Chun when he was just 12. A Wing Chun master named Chan Wan Shun moved into the Ip clan family hall to teach martial arts. At that time, the government was still unstable, but the people were slowly getting back to their normal lives. Ip liked to watch Chan's classes together with his peers. Until one day, when he finally got up the courage and he asked Chan to teach him Kung Fu. Chan refused initially, and he told Ip that people who came from wealthy families made poor students of Wing Chun. But since Chan was teaching on the property of Ip's family, he couldn't just refuse Ip's request. He said he would accept Ip, but under a condition. He required Ip to first pay a whopping 500 Taiyung, or silver dollars. Now at the time, that about could buy you several houses, which of course would be impossible for any child to raise. Clearly, Chan was discouraging Ip from becoming a student. Now, after some time, Ip returned to Chan with the money that he had asked for. Chan couldn't believe his eyes, and he thought that Ip stole the money from somebody else. So he brought Ip to his father immediately, and Ip's father told Chan that he and his wife gave the money to Ip so that Chan would accept him as a student. From then on, Ip became an official student of Chan, along with 15 other people. Chan was already 64 then, and three years later, Chan passed away. Aside from Chan, Ip also learned from Wu Chung Sok, Chan's second eldest student. In fact, he learned most of his skills and techniques from Wu, and not Chan, because Chan was already old and frail at the time. Chan saw Ip's potential, and he asked Wu to continue teaching Ip after his inevitable death. Ip moved to Hong Kong in 1908 with his relative's assistants, Lung Fu Ting, to study at a prestigious school called the St. Stephen's College. Hong Kong was under British rule back then, and the government employed Indian and Pakistani police officers. 
Generally, these police officers were not respectful to the Chinese, and they often showed cruelty to them. There was one time in particular when Ip had an encounter with one of them. He was with his classmate, and they were walking towards the school when they saw an Indian police officer beating a Chinese lady. Normally, he'd try to avoid getting involved in these situations, but for some reason this time he was compelled to engage to help his fellow citizen. Ip and his classmate went to the scene and defended the lady verbally. The police officer accused the Chinese lady of theft, but Ip and his classmate told him that he didn't have the right to beat someone even if the accusation was true. The police officer became angry and attempted to hit Ip. Ip, of course being adept in Kung Fu, countered simply, but left the police officer with a bloody face. Afterwards, the two ran away towards the school immediately. Ip's classmate told an old man who was from Foshan about the incident that had happened about the move that Ip executed against the police officer. The old man asked him to show the move, and after that, he told the young man to ask Ip to stop by. Ip and his classmate went to the old man the next day, and when they arrived, the old man asked Ip what type of kung fu he had studied in Foshan. Full of pride, Ip told the old man that he had studied the best type of kung fu, and that it was too much for the old man to understand. The old man persuaded Ip a little bit more, so Ip finally told him that he studied Wing Chun. The old man told him that he had heard of it and that there was a man named Cha Wa Shun who taught there. Then he asked Ip to demonstrate the Si Lim Tao form. Ip complied, but the response that he got from the old man was eh, not too great. Ip was humiliated, but he didn't say anything out of respect for the old man. He asked Ip to demonstrate another form, the Chum Ku. Ip complied again, but the old man just shook his head and said, not very good. Now, this comment made Ip very upset. The old man asked him again to demonstrate another form, the bugi. This time, Ip didn't know how to do the form, so he just told the old man that he didn't want to show him. The old man stopped asking him to show him any more forms, but to have chi sao, or sticky hands, with him. Ip agreed right away, because he thought he'd be able to show his true skill in that way. Ip started by throwing a punch, and the old man just blocked it and threw it aside. Ip got up again to land another punch, but the same thing happened. Ip was totally humiliated and stormed out. Apparently, after that incident, Ip didn't want to see the old man again. However, his classmate told him that the old man wanted him to visit once more. Ip refused, and his classmate relayed Ip's response to the old man. The old man told Ip's classmate to tell Ip his identity, that his name was Lung Bik. Upon hearing this, Ip immediately changed his mind and rushed to the old man even before class had ended. He was excited because Lung Bik was the youngest son of Chan Wa Shu's teacher, Lung Zhang. Lung Bik struggled financially, so Ip invited him to move in, giving Ip a good opportunity to learn Wing Chun. Lung taught him until his death in 1912. These four years of constant training allowed Ip to learn the entire system of Wing Chun. After four more years, when he was 24, Ip returned to Foshan to share his newly learned knowledge in Wing Chun with his Kung Fu brothers. Ip started to make a living as a policeman in Foshan. He had subordinates who learned Wing Chun from him, and he also taught several other people, including his friends and relatives, but this was all very informal. He didn't establish his own school at that point. Around that time, Foshan was visited by a Kung Fu master from northern China. This was 1918 or so, and he introduced himself as a praying mantis instructor and went to the Zhong Mu Wei, the Martial Arts Sports Association of Foshan. He watched the Kung Fu practitioners during their training, and he remarked that no one among those practitioners were capable of being a true Kung Fu master because they did not know the proper Kung Fu techniques. Afterwards, he challenged all the masters in Foshan to have a duel with him. When the town heard about this, they didn't know who they should choose to represent them because the best Kung Fu practitioners were pretty old, and the younger ones didn't have enough expertise. So they consulted an herbal doctor for some reason that I don't have any evidence of, named Li Kong Hui, whether he knew someone who could equal the praying mantis master. Now, Li was one of Ip's friends, so he asked Ip if he could be their representative in the duel. Ip agreed without second thought, because according to him, he was learning Kung Fu not only to defend others, but also to fight. The town then arranged the date and place of the event. Ip visited the venue every night, and when he learned this, the challenger also went to the venue the night before the event. He bragged to Ip that he could throw him with one hand 
using only the Phoenix Fist. In front of it, he demonstrated this technique by punching a wall made from rock and mortar. The power of his punch left a hole in the wall. Ip didn't flinch, but only smiled as the challenger left the room. On the day of the event, about 2,000 people came to watch. The entire theater venue wasn't enough to hold the whole audience, so some of them had to watch from outside. Those who were inside took their seats. Small tables were set up between the chairs where hot tea was served. And before the fight began, the referee tossed a coin to determine where on the stage the fighter should start. The toss favored Ip, and he chose to stand with his back to the audience. And the fight began. The challenger initiated a strike, and as Ip expected, it was the Phoenix Fist. Ip countered the attack with a grab and pulling technique. The challenger flew off the stage and crashed onto one of the tea tables. It was a very bad fall, and he broke three ribs. Apparently, the fight was over. Just one move. And this disappointed most of the people because they came to see an entertaining fight. But it was over in just a few seconds. The organizer worried about this, so he asked Ip to demonstrate how he defeated the challenger. Ip demonstrated the hand forms while the organizer arranged other entertainment, such as lion dances. The audience was ultimately satisfied and led to a huge party through the night as they celebrated their victory. This event made Ip famous all over Foshan. Ip had taught several students in Foshan, among them, however, only Kwak Fu and Lun Ka accepted students to pass down the art of Wing Chun. In 1949, Ip left Foshan and settled in Hong Kong after the Chinese Communist Party won the Chinese Civil War because Ip was a police officer on the side of the Nationalist Party, the Opposition Party. Ip started his own school in Hong Kong and continued teaching Wing Chun. However, Business was bad, because his students only stayed for a few months, and then they quit. Moreover, he never advertised his school, nor did he even put up a sign outside. He did this because he didn't want to teach everyone, but rather control who his students were. If he were to advertise his school, he would be obliged to accept any student who could pay. Otherwise, he had the right to refuse anyone who would come. Ip also said, quote, If you are a good teacher and martial artist, then the students will find you. Those students that search you out will be dedicated and will make good martial artists. They are true and good people. Ape only wanted to teach those who were serious in learning Wing Chun, not those who just had the money and quit halfway. This is the reason why only a handful of his students stayed long. Ip kept that philosophy throughout his 20 years of teaching Wing Chun. Ip taught Bruce Lee in 1957, and this continued for a year. During that time, the Chinese were against teaching martial arts to non-Asians. Lee was born in the United States, and he was part European. However, Ip taught Lee because Lee had deep interest in the art. He was one of the very few people who were personally trained by Ip Man. A decade had passed, and Ip still struggled financially. So in 1967, some of his students established an association called Ving Sun Athletic Association, with the objective of helping Ip earn money. However, Ip spent the money on opium. It passed away just five years later, on December 2nd, 1972, from throat cancer, at 149 Tung Choi Street in Hong Kong. Seven months later, Bruce Lee also passed away. Ip's greatest legacy was to make Wing Chun known globally. Ip Chun, his eldest son, continued his father's legacy, even at an old age. As of this writing, Ip Chun is already 94 years old. He was selected as the inheritor of the Wing Chun legacy among other Kung Fu masters who fought over that honor. Ip Man was buried in Wu Tip Shan Cemetery in Fun Ling, New Territories, Hong Kong. I find it fascinating that some of the challenges facing today's martial arts instructors are present throughout history, at least throughout the history that we talk about here. To focus on only teaching the most dedicated students may mean financial difficulty. To have dedicated students that will step up and try to take care of you, only to have that honor squandered. And to have people argue over legacy and who should carry on with the title. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it gives you a bit of context for Kung Fu, for... Bruce Lee's story for what martial arts in China 
was and is. Like I said in the intro, we've got a transcript of this. I went off script a tiny bit just for readability, but you should be able to follow along quite fine. We're building up more and more of these. So if you've missed some of the more recent historical episodes, check them out. Let me know what you think. If you like them, cool. If not, that's fine. I'll give you a 100% refund on what you paid to listen. <laughs> Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio.com and Whistlekick.com are the places to go. At Whistlekick is the social media to follow, and Jeremy at Whistlekick.com is my personal email address. That's all I've got for you today. I hope to hear from you, and I'll be back to talk to you soon. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 